They are the unsung heroes of the U.S. Navy. With a wrench in one hand and a rifle in the other, they build and fight. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, in mud, jungle, desert, and ice, the Navy's blue-collar warriors have made and paved the way to victory. They are the Seabees, next on Dangerous Missions. The Seabees are the Navy's construction force, made up of builders, equipment operators, mechanics, and engineers, and if attacked, they are fully prepared to fight back. There are nearly 23,000 Seabees in today's active and reserve force. They are capable of deploying anywhere in the world at a moment's notice to perform their We Build, We Fight missions. The Marine Corps is the Seabees main customer in wartime, and so our ability to support the Marine Corps so they can achieve their mobility and speed in battle is tremendously important. To reinforce the mission, Seabees build camps, set up command and control centers, secure perimeters, dig defenses, and supply the necessities to sustain life in the combat zone. The primary mission is construction. The secondary mission is to be able to defend yourself and your construction and your shipmates. If we need to, to drop the tools and pick up the weapons, so to speak, defend our assets against an enemy, hey, we're ready to go. For close to 60 years, in war and peace, on the beaches of Normandy and the sands of Iwo Jima, at Incheon and Saigon, Antarctica and Saudi Arabia, the Seabees have served and sacrificed. There's nothing we can't do, put it that way. Um, the Seabees can uh, make a difference everywhere they go. We considered all war effort to be dangerous and hazardous mission. We didn't realize how really dangerous and hazardous it was until after we got into it. Nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to do what they can to keep their fellow next to him from dying or having been killed. And you do what, what you have to do. In the 1930s, as the war clouds gathered over Europe and Asia, visionary leaders like Admiral Ben Morrell the chief of both the Civil Engineer Corps and the Navy's Bureau of Yards and Docks began work on a bold plan. As early as 1939, the U.S. Navy was already um, working on a plan called the Five Roads to Victory. Five Roads to Victory included a North Atlantic, a South Atlantic, an Aleutian Alaskan, a Mid-Pacific, and a South Pacific. And they believed that if they could actually construct bases along these roads that they could beat the Axis forces. To muster the men needed to build the forward bases, docks, ramps, and runways necessary for victory, Admiral Morrell devised his own plan. If war came, he prepared to recruit and train for combat the pride of America's labor force. The same men that built the Boulder, Grand Coulee, and Shasta Dams, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the East River Tunnels. Admiral Morrell had developed a, a plan to recruit skilled construction trades, put them in uniform, give them some defensive combat skills, weapons training, and put them into the field. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and destroyed most of the Pacific fleet, Admiral Morrell submitted his plan. Three weeks later, the first CB detachment was sent to Bora Bora in the South Pacific. They were named the Bobcats, after the code name for the island. On March 5, 1942, when paperwork cleared, the Navy's construction force, the Seabees, were officially born. By war's end, 250,000 men were trained and activated. We went to Camp Endicott, which is in Rhode Island. It's where we took our boot camp. You get that wind off that Atlantic Ocean in the wintertime. <laughs> it's about as cold as you can get. By the spring of 1942, the Germans occupied Europe and the Japanese had taken hundreds of islands in the Pacific. In response, the U.S. Navy unfurled the Five Roads Plan and the Seabees were selected to pave the way. It was decided that the Seabees would man and make all invasions launched from ship to shore, otherwise known as amphibious landings, and give the Allies a foothold on each and every road to victory. 
There were actually two aspects that made the CBs successful at amphibious landings. One was the fact that they were very strong individuals and they actually had the physical ability to work these things out. The second aspect was the fact that they had worked previously in the construction industry. They knew what they were doing. On the South Atlantic Road, from the coast of North Africa to the shores of Southern Italy, the Seabees bore combat and impossible physical odds. At Sicily, on the shallow beaches thought impossible to land on, the undaunted Seabees surprised the Germans. They lashed together nearly 6,000 one-ton 5x7x5 steel pontoons, some called magic boxes, to form giant causeways. Thousands of Allied troops and tanks battled their way ashore. The Seabees' brawn and ingenuity made the Allied invasion of Italy a success. But it was at Normandy, the most ambitious invasion ever attempted, on June 6, 1944, that the Seabees would meet their greatest logistical challenge and fully define their combat role. The Seabees had two roles, and, and ironically, they were diametrically opposite roles. One was to build, and the other was to demolish. In terms of building, the Seabees were involved in building the Mulberry Harbor. The Mulberry Harbor was an artificial harbor that allowed um, ships to dock off the coast of Normandy. The two massive artificial harbors, known as Mulberry A and Mulberry B, came in 175 giant pieces towed to France by tugs from England. There were three basic components, 200-foot-long pierheads for ships to tie off and dock, 60-foot mobile platforms to unload on, and 80-foot bridge spans to ferry supplies ashore. Also in tow, 74 obsolete ships and over 200 huge concrete caissons called phoenixes. They were sunk just off the French coast to create a breakwater and protect the harbors. 19-year-old CB Ray White rode to Normandy on a phoenix. It was very scary to say the least because with two tugboats pulling this huge concrete slab is what it was, the maximum speed that we could achieve would be about four knots per hour. And uh, of course, in that big a oh, thing, 200 feet long, 60 feet high, was an easy target for the E-boats. Halfway across, a German torpedo hit a nearby Phoenix. Six Seabees were thrown into the water, and a German patrol craft, known as an E-boat, spotted them. One man kept saying, God save me, God save us. And that E-boat could hear that noise and turned right over towards him and shot him dead. Shortly after, on the morning of June 6th, the Allied invasion of Normandy was on. Some 10,000 aircraft and 5,000 ships pounded the Normandy coast. CB Ray Durkees was on board a pierhead crossing the channel. It was four or five o'clock in the morning. The whole sky lit up and all oh, the, the, it was just like day. The, the, the battleships and the tin cans and the mines. I never saw so many ships in my whole life and they just blasted Omaha Beach. They just blasted it and blasted and That went on for hours. Among the first Allied troops ashore were dozens of Seabees who volunteered to serve with the combat demolition units. Among them, Jerry Markham on Omaha Beach. They had bands of obstacles, mined obstacles at different flight tide levels to catch the incoming landing craft to stop them from, from beaching. Our job was to blow a 50-yard path from the low level, tide low level, all the way to the high water mark. Markham's team began to unload their demolition supplies when disaster struck. My officer was standing by the rubber boat when the mortar hit at him and one of the seamen. And they were just obliterated with the, with the explosions. There must have been 500 pounds of assorted explosions in that rubber boat. So it was my job to take command. I could visualize machine gun fire, mortar fire, but never with such intensity, never with such thoroughness. Every inch of that beach was zeroed in. 
you had no place to hide, and you had a job to do. And you knew damn good and well if you didn't do that job, there was a hell of a lot of people wasn't going to get off of that beach or get on that beach. Half of my people were, were, were done. We were getting the wounded men, it's carrying them with us as far as, as, we, as we progressed up this beach. And we had to hide behind these mine obstacles for, for protection from the crossfire machine gun fire. It took them four hours, but Markham and his demolition team eventually turned their suicide mission into a success. They blew enough obstacles to clear a slim path for oncoming forces. Just being alive at the end of the day was quite a, quite a moment. <laughs> Despite their heroic efforts, hundreds of Allied troops were slaughtered that day as they hit the Normandy beaches. Anxiously waiting on a pierhead just offshore, CB Ray Durkees witnessed the carnage. We could see landmines going off and bodies fly in the air. Then you would see body arms, legs. Uh, you would see uh, uh, whole bodies with the head down and the feet up. It, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a good sight. I, well, I prayed. I prayed for their souls. Uh, and I said, I don't know why this, sh why this has to be. So, but it was. Some 6,000 Americans were killed, wounded, or missing at Omaha Beach. For their sacrifice to count, the Seabees knew that the invasion had to be sustained. Nine battalions, 10,000 Seabees worked tirelessly over the next few days, manning the landing craft and assembling the various giant pieces that formed the Mulberry Harbors. We got hooked up on D plus nine, and I, we, we were way ahead of schedule. And when, when that first LST came, everybody just clapped, clapped, and, and it was just wonderful to see them go on dry out in 30 feet of water onto shore. The Seabees helped land over a million troops, more than 20,000 vehicles, and tons of supplies. I think the papers have said afterwards it was a mission accomplished. The Seabees were probably the most important group of men who were there at Normandy. Had they not been able to actually get the men and the supplies to the shore, Normandy wouldn't have happened. With firm footholds in the Atlantic, the Navy's fighting trailblazers turned their might and muscle to the three roads of the Pacific Island Campaign. Across the vast Pacific, over a million square miles of ocean, and on hundreds of tiny coral atolls, the Seabees gave their might, their know-how, and their lives to build the bases that were the Allies' stepping stones to victory. They fought side by side with Marines and took more than 300 islands. They built and fixed over 100 airstrips, 400 docks, and literally thousands of camps, storage tanks, hospitals, and huts. The Seabees even had special stevedore battalions. Their sole job was to unload the mountains of materials needed to service a million and a half troops, pushing north, south, and west across the Pacific. The Seabees made the war effort in the Pacific possible because they allowed for the Allied forces to island hop. 80% um, of the Seabee forces were stationed in the Pacific. On island after island, on Tarawa, Saipan, Guam, and Tinian, Seabees landed troops and heavy equipment, battled a ferocious foe, built camps, fixed bomb holes, dug and crushed tons of coral and rolled and repaired runway after runway. By 1945, U.S. B-29 bombers and their P-51 Mustang fighter escorts began bombing runs on mainland Japan. The events that would take place on a tiny five mile long, two mile wide volcanic rock, chosen as the site for an emergency runway, would forever be etched in the annals of U.S. battle lore. It was called Iwo Jima. They needed a resting place for broken down B-29 bombers. So Iwo Jima was the perfect location because it was halfway in between the Marianas and mainland Japan. 
For the Seabees, Iwo Jima would prove to be the bloodiest battle ever. They had bombed that island for 72 consecutive days, and prior to the landing, they had shelled it from the had battleships and cruisers for three or four days. So we thought it would be a, a piece of cake to walk on the island, but boy, were we wrong. <laughs> At 9 a.m. on the 19th of February, 1945, American forces that included several Marine divisions supported by the 133rd Naval Construction Battalion led the invasion of Iwo Jima. CB Bill Connop was a young company runner assigned to land with the Marines. About noon, we went in. Our landing craft ran onto the beach. The ramp wouldn't go down in the boat. It was stuck. So several Marines started over the right side of the boat, and they all either fell in the water or, or fell back in the boat shot. And it just, I, what's going on? So finally, everybody started off the left side of the boat, which I did too. Connup and his company braved the fury and made it ashore. It didn't take long for me to know this was not the place to be. And they had every bit of the beach zeroed in, every bit of the beach zeroed in. They had Mount Suribachi to our left with guns, and to our right were the high bluffs. You try to dig into that, dig a foxhole into that uh, volcanic ash was impossible. It's just like trying to dig in a bed of wheat or grain. It just keeps caving in on you. You can't dig a foxhole. Under relentless fire, Bill Connop carried messages from platoon to platoon stuck on the terrifying beach. I wasn't really running. I was more or less crawling and, and maybe run a couple steps and dive and, and it did more, it was more crawling about 30, 40 yards. My last message I, I carried was about 5.30 in the afternoon. And it was a message to platoon leaders there to my right flank to maintain the present position for the night. And they all frowned on that. They, and they wanted to move up because the beach was just a, it was just a terrible place to be. Seconds after he delivered the order, Connup was hit. I got shrapnel in the face and back, and concussion. And I was evacuated uh, out the hospital ship about six o'clock. That was a million dollar wound to get off that darn, uh, not be wounded bad, and just to get off the island. Tragically, however, nearly 400 Seabees, 30% of the 133rd, would be casualties in the battle for Iwo Jima. On February 23rd, D-Day plus four, a foothold was finally established on the island. A small group of Marines under the threat of enemy fire climbed the 556-foot Mount Suribachi and defiantly hoisted the U.S. flag. Wounded CB Bill Connop was on a hospital ship at the time. All of a sudden, all the ships out there were honking their horns and everybody was pointing towards Mount Suribachi and we seen the flag flying there. It was, it was quite a sight to see. By day five, Japanese forces had retreated and dug into a labyrinth of caves and bunkers to the north end of the island. To the south, 4,000 Seabees landed with their heavy equipment, including 10-ton bulldozers and graders. They built a camp to house the troops and set about fixing the bombed-out airstrips. You had a 1,000 guys doing all they could do, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, working to get an airstrip on the U.S. that could be used. But Japanese resistance was staunch. Seabees working on the runway were under constant sniper and mortar attack. I didn't dwell on it, but I just, it seemed impossible to get off from there alive. It really did. And they were, they're fantastic with mortars. On day 10, the Seabees finished the first airstrip. The first B-29 we brought in there uh, came in on that first number one airstrip, and uh, that was really something. <laughs> I brought cheered, you know, we really thought, boy, ah, we, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that made you feel good. With an emergency runway secured on Iwo Jima, Allied bombing raids on mainland Japan 
only 660 miles away, intensified. We'd get up in the morning, and it'd just be just one big hum. And you'd look up, and there'd be B-29s as, uh, as far as you could see. Just unbelievable. Thousand plane range, you know, that's a lot of planes. And of course, naturally, some of them get shut up, and then they'd come back and come in, and that's what EWO was for. Bulldozer operator Cecil Webb was grading the South Strip when he witnessed a terrifying crash. He saw a crippled B-29 try and make an emergency landing. This thing came in there like that, but uh, with only two motors running on it, a four, four engine craft, and it was like this. No landing craft. I mean, landing gear. You couldn't let the landing gear down. When that first wing hit the ground, all you could see was dirt flying, just a big cloud of dust. And that thing slid probably for a quarter of a mile, I would guess. I knew he was gone. I just figured, you know, it was the end of that poor guy. But, but he come running out of there. We saw him run right out of that flame, you know, dirt and dust. That was a kind of a miracle, I thought. The entire B-29 crew, 11 lucky flyers, survived that day thanks to the airfield on Iwo. Well, there was over 6,800 killed on the island, but they say it, it saved 27,000 airmen lives on these B-29s who were able to land on Iwo Jima with a crippled, crippled aircraft from raids on Japan. So. I would say that it was uh, well worth taking. On June 21st, 1945, after a ferocious three-month battle, Okinawa II was secured. Allied forces now readied for the invasion of mainland Japan. But America's leaders decided on another war-ending option. On the island of Tinian in the South Pacific, a small detachment of Seabees loaded a secret weapon onto a brand new B-29 Super Fortress bomber called the Enola Gay. On August 6th, she took off. Five hours later, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, and Japan surrendered. It was the end of the road, and World War II had been won. Deployed across the four corners of the globe, the post-World War II Seabees moved mountains and conquered oceans. In the Korean War, the Seabees would add to their famed can-do reputation. In September 1950, at Incheon, on the west coast of Korea, they would battle the world's highest tidal range at 33 feet and achieve what some consider the most brilliant amphibious landing ever mounted. The Seabees overcame the enormous tides and built a pontoon causeway to put the 5th Marine Division ashore. In the early 1960s, small CB detachments were sent to Southeast Asia to spearhead America's Cold War counterinsurgency program. Lieutenant Junior Grade Frank Peterlin arrived in Vietnam in early 1965 and was the officer in charge of CB Team 1104. It was mostly civic action when we went over there. And, and we thought we were going over there to teach them how to construct, how to build. Uh, that's what we thought our, our effort was going to be at that time. As tensions mounted between North and South in 1965, Team 1104 was retasked. They were sent 50 miles north of Saigon to build a camp and an airstrip for an Army Special Forces team. On June 4th, Nine men of CB Team 1104 arrived at Dong Swai Base Camp and joined the nearly 400 local troops. They began work on a defensive perimeter, a four-foot earth berm that ran all the way around the L-shaped camp. Five days later, while they slept, they were attacked by the Viet Cong's elite 9th Division. On the 9th of June, a little bit before midnight, and all kinds of mortars started coming in. In fact, many of the guys were hit. People grabbed their weapons. We were carrying M14 rifles, uh, grabbed their rifles and, and headed for the berm. 
We were split up, went to our alert positions, and it, uh, the fire just kept on coming in. The mortars, the rounds, the uh, firing for nearly the next couple hours. Everybody was afraid, but yet you still had a job to do. You did it. The 400 defenders were surrounded by an estimated 2,000 determined Viet Cong. About 1 a.m., Chief McCulley was shot. I took a round through the right arm uh, in, in my shoulder area. Your adrenaline's pumping and, and you're, you're so busy, you, you don't really feel the pain or anything like that. Shortly after, the Viet Cong charged the camp, firing and unloading flamethrowers. The flamethrower went right between Johnny and I. I went to the left, Johnny went to the right. Johnny McCulley scrambled out of the burn and eventually made his way into the nearby woods. Frank Peterlin and a handful of men held their position at the burn. And we, we just kept firing back. Uh, and, and then finally, a little after two, I think it was, is when the massive wave came and overcame, overcame the camp. And it's at that time that everybody kind of got split up. When I got down from the bottom of the berm, there was an explosion, and that was a, actually a round to my foot. It severed the main nerve. Now wounded, Larry Iman, along with Marvin Shields and the 20 or so troops left alive, made their final stand in a district headquarters building at the south end of the camp. Peterlin, unable to run, got trapped behind VC lines. And what I crawled into was the middle of a uh, VC unit, and I kind of rolled into a fighting hole or a foxhole at that point. I had my 45, even though, I guess, during target practice before that, I thought I'd do better throwing at somebody than shooting if you wasn't too good at it. In the early hours of June 10th, the Seabees were still in the headquarters building, pinned down by VC machine gun fire. Marvin Shields and Army Special Forces Lieutenant Charles Williams grabbed a rocket launcher and made their way toward the VC position. With four well-placed shots, they took out the enemy machine gun. It was then that Marvin Shields was hit. Where Marvin got, I think it was his right leg, was pretty well severed and extreme loss of blood during that time. But he still was there until 1300, until the air vac when the choppers got in the next, next uh, afternoon. The Seabees held on until 1 p.m. on June 10th, when 13 hours after the assault began, American forces came to the rescue. As the fog that blanketed the camp lifted, U.S. aircraft strafed and bombed to suppress the VC. Then, three rescue choppers defied enemy fire and swooped in to get survivors. Oh, it was a good feeling to know that they were coming in. We're eventually going to get out of there. Larry Iman and the mortally wounded Marvin Shields were on the first choppers out. During that time, he was still, you know, joking with people, encouraging people, and this type of thing. But he, after the helicopter got in here, it's when he died of lack of blood. I think loss of blood. I think it's it's, it's hard any time you lose lose someone close. When the three choppers left, there were still two wounded Seabees trapped behind enemy lines. Johnny McCulley in the woods to the east, and Frank Peterlin in a foxhole, unable to move. It was a very long time, believe <laughs> me, sitting there in, in, in a hole for two nights and one day, wondering what was going to, going to happen and who was going to pop their head in and when were they going to stop firing. On the morning of June 11th, U.S. rescue forces came back in and, again under fierce fire, risked their lives to get the last two men of CB Team 1104 out. As the helicopter raised up about three feet off the ground, I came out of the woods and they sat back down. I got, as I pulled myself on the helicopter, I see Frank Peterlin there in the stretcher on the chopper. And I was very happy to see him. Of the nine CBs at Dong Swai, Seven were wounded and two died in the action. Marvin G. Shields and William C. Hoover. It was very difficult. Just, it's just part of you that's gone too. 
Bill Hoover and I were probably the closest. Bill was more like a brother and he was our friend. The conflict in Southeast Asia soon escalated into a full-blown war. By 1969, 21 full-strength construction battalions deployed to the region. 29,000 men built six major ports, eight airfields, 1,600 miles of road, and six naval bases. Even as the war in Vietnam raged, Seabees would put their lives on the line in a host of peacetime operations. At the frozen ends of the earth, Seabees would surmount the terrifying conditions and build ice stations in Antarctica. Since the 1950s, U.S. Navy C-130 Hercules planes have flown into Antarctica. Equipped with skis, the huge transports would land on ice runways rebuilt every year by Seabees. The Navy came here in 1955 to support the greatest international scientific endeavor ever mounted on Antarctica. The Navy's mission down there was to support the National Science Foundation. Um, we supported the explorers, any of the scientists that went down there to study, whether it was the sea life or the ozone layer. Our job was to make sure that they had everything that went, they needed. Covering over five million square miles, Antarctica lies at the extreme end of the world. Not only is it the coldest place on Earth all year round, it is among the windiest. 100 mile an hour snowstorms are common. The intense isolation, absence of light or dark for half the year combined to make Antarctica one of the most inhospitable and dangerous duty stations on Earth. In 1955, Operation Deep Freeze began. 500 Seabees were sent as part of Task Force 199. This Navy team of specialists built the infrastructure for dozens of international science and research teams that began to arrive in 1957. Seabee demolition expert Julian Goodmanson first arrived by boat in 1956. It would be the first of seven exhilarating tours. He entered McMurdo Sound on the east side of the continent in a convoy led by a powerful icebreaker. We had always had a helicopter flying ahead trying to give the icebreaker the best routes. I could see some cracks here and head for this crack and that crack and so that would make it a lot easier if they could get the breaker into a crack where they could just shove the ice apart. It, it was fantastic. Goodmanson worked on Antarctica's first nuclear power plant. He blasted, leveled, and cleared a space to house the reactor. They did a pretty good job there. You know. <laughs> in recognition of Julian Goodmanson's contributions to the projects in Antarctica, in 1967, the National Science Foundation announced that a mountain had been named in his honor. Today, Mount Goodmanson proudly overlooks McMurdo Sound. When CB heavy equipment operator Michelle Lavoie first landed in 1985 for the first of her three tours, she was literally uplifted by the experience. We got off the plane and we were in the middle of what we called a herbie, which means that the, the snow was being blown around at like 100 knots. It was amazing. I remember the guys grabbing me thinking I was going to blow away, but you couldn't see. You could not see 50 feet in front of you. It was amazing and I thought, what in the heck did I do? <laughs> the fearsome weather conditions would be the CB's greatest danger. It was 126 minus degrees Fahrenheit down there, which is amazing. The weather was our biggest danger. I would have to watch your face and you would have to watch mine because you could turn as white as a sheet of paper within minutes. It was so dry down there that you did not know exactly how cold you were. So we really had to watch each other. She was soon put to work. My job as an equipment operator varied. I did everything from remove snow from the buildings, because every night you could get snowed in. Um, I did it, we helped build a runway. We did a lot of blasting and quarry work. I did a lot of crane operations, um, a lot of forklift work, a lot of running dump trucks, various jobs. One of the most critical tasks for the CBs arriving in August each year was to clear and pack the runways one on land, the other on frozen seawater. 
the surveyors would go out there and they would map out the whole runway, all 10,000 feet, and the aprons where the, where the planes would park, and then we would go to town. We'd get our snow blowers in there and start blowing the snow off the runway. One of the most precarious parts of the operation was driving 10-ton bulldozers over the transition between the land and the ocean runways. In time, grit from the tires ate away at the ice, turning it into slush. Sometimes you would drive across there with your dozers and you didn't know if it was going to hold you or if it wasn't going to hold you. And uh, so we would literally keep the doors to our dozers open or the tractor trailers. We would keep them open because when you drove across there, you, you knew. You know, if you had to jump, you were going to jump. <laughs> Despite the rigors and perils, Seabees continued to support the science stations in Antarctica until 1993, when civilian contractors took over. Their skills and ability to work under duress means the Seabees are increasingly called upon to serve in a multitude of peacetime activities. They include humanitarian and disaster relief efforts all over the world. But their primary mission is, and always will be, to support the armed forces especially the Marines in combat. This was effectively demonstrated in Operation Desert Storm in January 1991. Rear Admiral Mike Johnson was in command of the construction battalions. We had about 2,800 Seabees on the ground in the regiment uh, supporting the Marines as they moved north and west in Saudi Arabia. The Seabees were critical to the success of General Norman Schwarzkopf's bold end-run strategy. As Allied forces swung up and around entrenched Iraqi forces, the Seabees built an estimated 200-mile network of roads. And as the Marines breached uh, in the ground war in late February, uh, we were probably maintaining 200 to 250 kilometers of multi-lane road. The many hard-won CB achievements, like the roads and runways laid in Operation Desert Storm, give today's leaders a roadmap to train and ready the next generation of CBs, as they too risk their lives and go into harm's way anywhere and everywhere on Earth. Before they put their lives on the line in a combat situation, CBs are put through rigorous and realistic battlefield scenarios. Here in the searing heat of California's high desert, at Fort Hunter Liggett, CB leaders prepare their troops for all they might encounter in a war zone. We have a two-week training exercise that uh, tests our ability to get the battalion moved from home port out into a field environment to establish a defensive perimeter and then to be able to go out from that perimeter, execute construction projects uh, in support of uh, Marine Corps Task Force. The CB's primary mission is to give logistical support to the Marines in combat. They will build whatever is needed, ramps, bridges, or runways, to keep the Marines moving. If attacked, be it conventional, biological, or chemical, the CBs will defend their construction, their assets, and their shipmates. So we're trained to deal with any level of, of hostile force that we might encounter, everything from just uh, rioters who are trying to disrupt our construction and disrupt our progress to more aggressive forces that might have weapons and want to attack uh, the CBs while they're there. The other hazards that we deal with are just the normal hazards of construction. In addition to a base camp, the CBs build a second camp a few miles away in a strong forward defensive position. From here, uh, we have good clear views out across the valley below. Um, what you want to look for in a, defensive, a defensible piece of terrain, um, you want it up high where you have good observation. You want good fields of fire. Um, for your direct fire weapons, rifles and machine guns, what you're trying to do is achieve what they call grazing fire. You want to get the enemy from the knees to the neck. And coming down off of this hill before it hits the flat, we have about 250 meters of that. That's a good thing. They dig foxholes in prime locations for gun placement and defense. A well-built defense, it should be set up pretty much like one huge ambush. The enemy knows you're there, but they may not know the details of your fire plan. Where are your machine guns? Where are your Claymore mines? So once they get into a point where they may attempt to breach, 
That's where you got them. They're in your kill zone then. Carpenters build an observation tower to enhance camp security. The uh, hardest part would probably be uh, getting all your uh, all your legs together within a uh, quarter inch, making sure that they're all square. They all have the same diagonal uh, length on them. The timber tower gives you an overall view of your entire area. From left to right, it gives you a 360 degree range. It allows for security purpose. I mean, it's key. Over the two weeks the battalion is camped in the desert, they face a host of surprise attacks, some conventional, some invisible. Everybody needs to be prepared to fight in a chemical environment if that's necessary. So on go the suits, on go the masks. Now, after all that stuff's on, you need to be prepared to continue with your mission, whatever that is. But in this kind of situation, 95, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, once you get all that equipment on, it's extremely hot. Dehydration is a factor that can really come in fast. Um, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, that can come on fast. First employed to great effect in World War II, Seabees will often deploy the mighty Bailey Bridge. This is the kind of bridge that the Seabees would erect and deploy to allow the Marine Corps to move forward in battle, bring their uh, tanks and troops forward. To imitate what might happen in battle, these CBs are surprised by a simulated enemy attack. Their brothers in arms, the Marines, relish their role as hostile forces in these training scenarios. When an attack hits, CBs must complete the task at hand and trust that other CBs guarding the project perimeter will defend them. When their immediate task is done, they join the fight and repel the enemy. A debriefing from the Marines helps the CBs hone their defensive skills. There's a guy right there flying around, they didn't even know he's there. Gotta check your flanks. You see somebody, yeah, everyone's gonna be firing that way. You gotta be the one to turn around and off. We got someone back behind us. That's where the enemy's gonna come. On the last morning of the battalion exercise, the exhausted CBs are hit by a full bore frontal attack. In this exercise, the Marines breached the defenders' first line of defense, but CB reinforcements eventually secure the camp. With the field exercise over, the Seabees are better prepared to build and fight on the 21st century battlefield. In modern warfare, there is no clear line in the sand. This is the front, this is the rear area. That's not real clear in modern warfare, in maneuver warfare. So that's exactly what we need to be prepared to do. Drop the tools, pick up the weapons. For close to 60 years in peace and war, the Seabees have built the huts, ramps, roads, and runways that allow the Navy to land, the Marines to move, and the Air Force to fly. With their labor and their lives, from Omaha to Okinawa, Alaska to Antarctica, the Navy's blue-collar warriors, the Seabees, have forged the path to victory. It was a great experience, as long as you got, as long as you made it. Unfortunately, too many guys didn't make it. You don't, you don't think about the danger. You think, hey, this is the mission. Here's what I've got to do. Well, I don't consider myself a hero. I was just a very scared 19-year-old CB trying to do my job and uh, trying to survive. The real heroes were the ones that never came back.